Okay. I was supposed to get this lucky enough today. Let's see if I remember it today. <laughs> so I'm uh, Martin McClure. I work at uh, Gemplug Systems on a variety of products there. Uh, I gave this talk originally at ASUG, uh, along with uh, my co-author of the talk, uh, Andres Malud. Um, there, the talk took us 75 minutes to give. Uh, here I have 30. So naturally, I have added some material. <laughs> so hang on, it might be a wild ride here. So, suppose you have some kind of large collection, and you want to find a specific element of that collection. Well, you can search through it linearly, but that gives you order M. You double the size of the collection, you on average double the size of the, double the amount of time that the search takes. Not too great. But if you can sort the elements, then you can use a binary search. And this improves things quite a bit. You get um, you get order log M. If you now, you, in order to double the amount of time the search takes, you have to actually square the size of the collection, so it grows much more slowly. But it is still growing, and this only works if you can sort the collection. So that's two strikes against that. Um, so what you really might want is something that takes constant time, regardless of the size of the collection. So the question is, well, is there such a thing? Yes, there is. It's a hash table. I'm just not going to talk about today. So, what is a hash table? Let's do a quick example. So we've got here, I've got uh, some contact objects um, that contain the name of the contact along with some other stuff. And I'm going to want to look them up by the name of the, of the person. And because the name is what I'm going to look up, I'm going to call the name the key, because that's what I'm going to look it up by. And I'm going to put it in a hash table, which is uh, an array or something very much array-like. Uh, but, but now we go, well, where do I put each name? You know, to put it in there so that I can look it up without doing a linear search. Well, we have something called a hash function. And the hash function in this example is going to map a name into some index in the hash table. And it's a function that is just some usually relatively simple mathematical arithmetic function that looks at the bytes of, of the name and will give me some somewhere in the hash table to look. So if I start, I get, you know, so Andres may map to 8 and, and uh, uh, you know, Dale may map to 4 and, you know, whatever this function is. You know, so each one we get a different, uh, possibly a different um, you know, a different uh, uh, place in the table. So now we've spread that, these things out throughout the table. And now in order to find a particular element, like say I want to find James, I run the hash function again on James and it tells me two and I know exactly where to look. So this is why it's constant time. It doesn't matter how big this thing is. You know, I just run the hash function and it takes the same amount of time for anything and, and there you go. So. One side thing, why the name hash? Well, in English, one of the meanings of the word hash is to chop and mix, and that is in, indeed the sense we're using it here. In fact, where I come from, hash usually means this. Um, the concept of hashing in computer science dates from about 1953. The term hash comes from a little later in the 1960s. So, as we see, it's really pretty simple. So my talk is, no, my talk is not over. It's really not quite that simple. <laughs> so, we'll spend the rest of our time dealing with the specific uh, difficulties. So first, let's look at what hash tables there are in Smalltalk. Um, we have a bunch of them. There are, uh, we have sets. The sets uh, store uh, the key objects themselves, and that's about it. Um, sets also assure that things are unique. Um, that's kind of useful in some cases. Um, even more uses are for dictionaries. A dictionary takes a key object and associates it with some value object. So we see these all over the place. And uh, 
in the interest of time, I'm going to assume that you all are pretty familiar with those. And my apologies to many of you who are not, because I just don't have time. <laughs> so, um, so hash functions in small talk have a couple of uh, differences over just the simple kind of hash function that I was talking about earlier. Once again, they map a key, they take a key and they come up with an index in a table. So in small talk, the hash function is divided into two parts. You have the hash method, which you send to an object and it returns you some small integer that somewhere in the small integer range, usually somewhere large uh, within the small integer range, usually the positive small integer range, but not always. And then we take the second part and we take that, whatever the hash method returns, and we take it modulo of the size of the table to map that large range of integers into however big the table is. And so that's the complete hash function. And this is kind of clever, because for general purpose hash collections, uh, the, the object itself has responsibility for knowing what kind of information within the object is going to contribute to the hash function. But it doesn't know necessarily, the object doesn't necessarily know how big the table is that it's going to be stored in. And the table doesn't necessarily know what kind of objects are going to be stored in it. So, you know, by dividing the responsibility this way, it's a good object-oriented division of responsibility, and we get general purpose hash functions that actually work. Now, if you're going to build your own hash table, for instance, and say it's only going to store one kind of object, you could put the hash function all together. There's no reason not to do that. But for all the general purpose ones, in small talk, you know, we divide it up like that. So, in the title of this talk, I talked about building your own. Why would you want to build your own if Smalltalk has these nice sets of dictionaries anyway? And there's several potential reasons you might want to do that. You might have some special requirements that those don't fill. Um, there are some special ones in Smalltalk already. Most Smalltalk implementations have weak ones and this and that. But, you know, like I had one that required um, one key maps to two values and it had to be high performance, and it had to be large, and I had to be able to turn the weakness on and off. So I built it, you know, from scratch. Um, security, which if we have time, I will get back to later. Um, the hash functions in most small talk implementations are not particularly secure. Um, you might want something that has better performance than you can get otherwise, um, either space or speed. Um, most of the hash functions are pretty good, but but you might want to build your own, and if you're going to build your own, you have to need to know about some other things, like how hash functions relate uh, to domains of keys. There is such a thing as a perfect hash, and this always produces a unique index in the table. No matter what key you give it, it gives you a unique index. This is a nice property. However, it has a downside which is that in order to provide a unique index for every possible key in the domain, it requires the table size to be at least as big as the domain. So if the domain is, like for my contact example, maybe if I only have four friends ever, then the table of 10, you know, or 12 is five, right? And I can never have any more friends. But if I want to be able to have a general contact list that I can give to anybody else in the world, then I have to be able to store all the names in the world and any name that there might come up. And this is, I'm not going to build a table that big in the memory of my machine. So, so the other thing is about perfect caches are, to a very good approximation, you are never going to use one, and therefore we're going to forget about them. <laughs> so, so imperfect caches are what we deal with every day. And we map a large key domain onto a smaller table. And that has, you know, that's a very useful thing to do, but it also has a corollary, which sometimes, of necessity, it must map more than one possible key to the same index. And that's called a collision. Now, you have a potential problem here. If your hash function happens to map all of the keys onto the same index, you end up with the worst case performance of a hash table, which is order n again. So in most cases, it's order one. 
but there's always the possibility of it degrading to murder him. So collisions. Here we have a five element uh, table, which is actually pretty typical size in most small block implementations for a new empty table. They'll initialize it to five if they don't know how big it's going to need to be. So we're going to add a few keys. And first key maps to three, second key maps to one, third key maps to three. Boom. Okay, so how do we handle this? There are two basic strategies for handling collisions in hash tables. One, you can put more than one key into the same slot, cram more than one key in there, or you can find an empty slot somewhere else in the table. So those are your two strategies. The first strategy um, is called hash buckets, and uh, for putting multiple keys into the same slot. So you you know you have this bucket and you and you put a key into it and you put another key into it and you put some more keys into it and eventually you know you've got all these keys in the same bucket. But within the bucket, it's linear search. The hash function will find you the bucket, but inside the bucket, it's not ordered, so you have to do a linear search to it. So you don't want too many collisions. <coughs> um, so how do you implement one of these buckets? We'll look at two common implementations. Uh, linked buckets is just a linked list. So you have a hash table here, and when I'm same, I'm going to add the same key. So at three, we add a linked list node that points to our first key. And we add our second key, which maps to one. And then our third key maps to three again, right? So it just gets inserted into the beginning of our linked list. And now, if we look up either key one or key three, we start at this slot, we look through the linked list. No, that's not it. I'm looking for key one. And oh, here it is. Right? So um, this is very simple to implement. Um, but there's another popular technique, which is using an array for the bucket. And so here in this example, we're going to start with empty arrays, um, and you know, make an array of one, make an array of one, and here we're going to make an array of two and add our third key onto the end of that array. Same thing. You find a key, you search through the array to find it. You know, once you've done your hash function to find which bucket to go into. So that's pretty much the way buckets work. The next um, thing is to find uh, an empty slot to use instead of putting multiple things in one slot, is just find an empty slot in the table itself. And there's a lot of ways to do this that you might find in the literature. Um, linear probing is one of the best, I think, and it is the way that most small blocks happen to use. Um, we'll look a little later why that's one of the best ways to do it. So but this is the only way I'm going to talk about of finding empty slots. So here's our same five element table, and we're going to put our key one in, and key two, and now key three, remember, is going to go in here, and it's going to cause this collision. And what we're going to do is we're going to start here, and we're going to go, oops, it's full. And then we're going to go, well, let me try the next one. And if that's full, let me try the next one. If that's full, let me try this one. So in this case, the next one is free, and it's free. And when you're looking, doing a lookup in this kind of a hash table, you start at the, at the at this slot where the hash function tells you to start, and you go, is this the guy I'm looking for? No. Look at the next slot. Is this the one I'm looking for? In this case, maybe it wasn't. You know, maybe we're looking for something that isn't there that hashed to three. And so it goes and looks here and says, oh, it's nil, therefore it's not in the table. So things that these strategies have in common is that things that map to the same slot have to be searched linearly. And, yes? Isn't that a simple strategy? Can we jump in front of the collision set in large table? So every time you find a collision, enlarge the table. Um, that will, enlarging the table is difficult. Um, enlarging the table is very expensive because you have to rehash everything in it. And rehashing everything in it will not guarantee you that you will not have collisions. <laughs> so, so you do enlarge the table um, when it gets too full, right? You know, when it gets too close to full, then it, the performance will be great, and we'll see that a little later. And you do want to enlarge the table. Um, 
Um, so in addition, in linear probing, besides um, linear search, keys that map to nearby table slots can add to the search time. Because, because if you're going um, in your table, you know, so here if I, if I had a collision uh, here, if I added a couple here, then, you know, even though the collision is here, the fact that these things are full means that the second thing that maps to index 2 is going to have to be put all the way down in 5. So I only have two things that map to 2, but one of them I have to search all the way down to here to find. So... So, of these different strategies, which ones should you choose? Uh, so, choosing a hash function. Okay, this is a very deep subject that I don't have much time to say anything about, so I'm not going to say a lot, but there are a couple of guidelines that I can give. The basic idea of a hash function is to take data which is not random, usually, Sometimes your application will deal with data that is truly random, but usually your data has a meaning and is therefore by definition not random. And what you want to do is you want to map that to indices that look random. So as a result, you want to get the keys evenly distributed throughout the table. So you want to have, you don't want things clumped at the beginning. Um, some hash functions um, use like multi small multipliers like 33 and on each character of the string, and they multiply it. And so a very short string will have a very small number, you know, very small hash, even, even though it really should have a large one. So, um, so try to get an even distribution, like a random number generator would, and try to get the number of collisions to be sort of comparable to, or at least not too many more than an actual random number generator would give you. Well, how many collisions does a random number generator give you? Well, this many. So what we have here um, is we have a graph. The x-axis of the graph is the load factor, which is the number of keys relative to the table size. So here in the middle, we have a 1.0. That means our number of keys is exactly equal to the, to the table size. And on the y-axis, we have um, the average number of keys per hash value value of the hash function. So clearly we start at 1.0 because the very first thing we put in our table cannot collide with itself. But you know, even though the table is not very full, we start to move collisions almost immediately. By the time it's half full, we've got you know, one and a quarter times the number. And this is just the way randomness works, right? I mean, the birthday paradox, we all know that in this room there's probably uh, there's maybe an 85 to 90 percent probability that two people have the same birthday, even though there are far fewer than 365 people in the room. So it's the same thing, and you know, and it just keeps on going up, and it does curve very slightly. And it's trying to approach a, eventually will approach one because there won't be really any. There will be a very low probability of any empty slots left in the table, and it will eventually uh, go there. So other things about hash functions, um, avoid inventing your own unless you know the math. I don't. I do not have enough number theory to get a good hash function. Um, and number, enough number theory will get you a good random number generator, but even then it might not get you um, a, a good hash function because it's actually very difficult to test the properties of hash functions. Because the performance of a hash function is by definition defined by your data set because, as we saw, there always exists, for every imperfect hash function, there exists a data set that will make your hash table perform extremely poorly. So, don't believe what you find online. There's a lot of advice online. A little of it is good advice. I have found amazingly, amazingly bad advice online stated in such a way that it sounds really plausible. So really be careful there. Um, <laughs> Peer-reviewed papers are actually quite a bit better, but be careful. When was it published? Who 
What were the exact claims? What did they test? How applicable is it to your situation? So be careful what you're reading. I, and is there a newer paper that refutes the paper that you're reading now? <laughs> and if so, which one is right? Okay, maybe both, I don't know, you know. <laughs> and lastly, do not believe what I tell you. <laughs> so if you can't believe anybody, what are you supposed to do? Test. Test it yourself. Test it with your data. Figure out whether it works for you. Okay. Collisions. Again, and in a little more detail. So, we talked about these various strategies, buckets versus linear probing. So which strategy should you choose? Well, one thing is, well, how many different places are we going to need to look to find the key we're looking for? Because it seems obvious that the more places you have to look, the slower it's going to be, right? We have this linear search problem. So here we have buckets, Once again, we start with one, because you know, when the table is empty, when there's only one thing in the table, we're going to get that the first time, because there's no collisions. And then as the number of collisions increases, as we saw in that graph with the, for the random number generator, you're going to get more collisions, so it's going to get, you know, you have a bigger probability of hitting a bucket that has more in it, that you're going to have to linearly search, so it goes up this nice little linear way on average. Um, up to the point where you know you're 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 going to have to search two times on average if you've got twice as many uh, twice as many elements as you have slots in your table. Whereas linear probing, because of the fact that it clumps up and it makes things eventually makes you search farther because it's searching past things that didn't map to that particular um, index in your table. So it goes along pretty well at first, and then it, and you get up to about Oh, 70, 75, 80%, you know, it really starts taking off, and, and it's, you know, by the time you get to 95%, you're doing about 10 and a half searches on average. So, from this graph, it looks like buckets win, clearly. But, what if the cost per probe is not equal between the two strategies? Because if they were, then buckets would win. But what if it's not? It turns out it isn't. And the reason that it's not is because of the cache architecture of modern processors. So, um, so there are caches between the memory system, which is fairly slow, and the processor. That cache, uh, usually cache lines of about 64 bytes is pretty common in modern architectures. So, and there's various levels. There's a level one cache, which is closest to the processor, then a level two, then a level three, then the memory. And on the desktop machine I have at work, um, in order to access uh, memory that is in the level one cache, it takes about one nanosecond. Okay? You can ex execute 10 or 20 instructions that don't need memory in that time. To access memory that is in main memory, 60 nanoseconds. You can execute a thousand or so instructions that don't access memory in that time. So there's a pretty big difference between those. So, um, so let's make a hypothesis that the cost is proportional to the level one cache misses. Because it seems plausible that, you know, with all of those instructions that we can execute, that the computing of the hash function is not really that important, um, unless it's really, really slow, but that accessing memory is really what's going to cost us here. So if that's our hypothesis um, for an ideal um, hash function, which is really just a random number generator, uh, that is for an identity set, which is the simplest possible thing to implement. What can we predict about that? Well, the prediction for linked buckets is that we start at, so here we've got the load factor again, same as before. Now we have the average level one cache misses per lookup predicted. So we're predicting that it takes a minimum of two and goes up from there linearly. Why is that? Because we have to access a chunk of the table, 
Right? So we get a cache line, which is 64 bytes. We load that in. We load in whatever the 64 bytes that contain the correct index of the table. I'm assuming that we're using this table frequently so that the header is already in, in the cache. And then we have to access a linked list element. And that's in a different object. And I'm assuming that the other op that the second object is in a different cache line because there's no reason it should be in the same cache line because cache lines are relatively small compared to the whole object memory. So in order to reach this one, it would be two accesses. In order to reach this one, it would be two accesses. In order to reach this one, it would be three cache misses in order to get that. Um, so hence this line here. Uh, if we go with uh, array buckets, we get the same linear growth, but we get it at a much less steep rate. Why is that? Well, with an array, the same thing. We start at two, because we have to access this, and then we have to access this. But here, we access this, that's one. We access this, that's two. This is almost certainly in the same cache line, or usually in the same cache line. Once the um, once the buckets get big enough to have more than a cache line's worth of, of elements in the same bucket, then you've got another cache line miss, which is why, which is why these lines go up at all. And in fact, there's three of them there because it's based on whether you have four elements per cache line, eight elements per cache line, or 16 elements per cache line. This bottom line doesn't look like it's growing at all on this graph, but in fact it is. If you look at the raw data that I plotted here, you would see that way out here at the end, it's at two and two millions, and it would actually continue growing. So let's look at linear probing and see how it does. Okay, so it's still got that curve where it takes off to the moon when it starts getting full. But the interesting thing is it starts down here at one. It starts at, you know, maybe twice as fast if this is really what's dominating, and, and then grows. And once again, we have the 4, 8, and 16. And the reason for, for that is, once again, the cache line locality. When I'm searching here, I just search for the 1, I get it. I'm searching for this, 1, I get it. I search here, and then I search here. But that has a high probability of being in the same cache line and costing basically nothing extra. Right? It costs, you know, this is the 60 nanoseconds, and then this is the one nanosecond, so like 61 nanoseconds. So we're thinking that that's going to be the way it's good. And so this, for low loading, this is going to be considerably faster, is our prediction. The, uh, this range here is actually the range of interest. It's going from about 35 to 75%. And for instance, in Faro, which does use linear probing, if a collection reaches 75% full, it doubles, slightly more than doubles it in size, and now we're down to 35%. And in this range, um, this clearly wins over that. Uh, this lazy buckets thing is a thing I threw in for the um, for the longer talk that I skipped today. But of course, this was just a hypothesis. So we should test it. So I did. So here's some actual timings that I took um, of this. We have some test overhead down here, um, a few nanoseconds. So this is average, this is nanoseconds per lookup um, load factor. This is over a table of about a million uh, in size. And, uh, and so we can see that linear probing actually does, in this range that we're interested in, linear probing is clearly the fastest, once you subtract the table overhead, it may in fact be twice as fast as the, uh, as the two array things. Uh, we've got some good predictions out of our, out of our model, though. Uh, we predicted sort of linear growth on the two buckets. We did get that. Um, we we um, uh, predicted that there would be this curve for the linear probing, which there is. Uh, we predicted that the linear probing would be fastest in this range, which it is. Um, there's some things that we didn't predict. There's, why does the testing overhead increase, and why does it drop during this range? That's repeatable. That wasn't, you know, every time I ran this, that happened. No idea. Something to do with memory management, not directly related to this particular thing. Um, there's this dip down here, you know, we didn't predict that. 
I have a, I have a suspicion that that is due to level two, level three cash. Uh, uh, that it's not until you get the, the thing big enough to uh, to eliminate level two, level three cash things, and you're going only to main memory to get to this nice linear behavior. And we have one complete failure of prediction, which is link buckets, which were supposed to be slower than array buckets, are actually faster than array buckets in Vero. Why? I don't know. But, you know, this is why you test. Um, so my last topic is um, security. A little bit of brief uh, look at it there. So the same thing yeah. Can you go back to the graph? Yeah. Sure. You say that the linking package projects are faster than the web package, but that may have to do with how you build the collection. If your code only builds the collection, it has a high chance of having to talk to error. But if you do a lot of stuff in between adding to the collection, then memory will be more scattered away, and that will change. Yes, um, and in fact, these graphs looked a little different before I thought to completely randomize the order in which I looked them up. Okay. <laughs> so, so I think these are better results than I had before that. Um, okay, security. So remember that the um, that there's always a data set that will make your performance degrade to order n. By making, by picking, if you can pick data that makes, that the hash function always returns the same value for different data, and you fill your hash table with that data that's all colliding, your performance is going to be terrible. And so, if you have an application, and many web applications do are in this position, if you're in a position where some random joker can actually choose your keys for you, you have to watch out. And there have been a number of languages that have fallen prey to hash flooding attacks, mostly on web applications. And, um, and there's a lot of people out there providing alternative hash implementations in various languages because of this problem. And small talks hash functions that are built in are not secure. So if you have an application where someone else can choose your keys in your hash table, you should think about this. Um, there's one in particular that's uh, being pretty popular right now. It's a thing called SIPHash. I haven't looked at the map. I haven't looked at how it's implemented. But if the basic concept is that you pick a random, when your server comes up and builds this hash table in the first place, you get this 128-bit random number, which that number is used in the hash function in a way that modifies the hash function such that it is impossible, supposedly, without actually guessing the 128-bit number. In, uh, you, know, you can't actually perform the attack because you cannot guess which values will map to the same hash keys. Uh, and of course, 128 bits is big enough that you know you will definitely reboot your server and choose another random 128 bit key before they guess it. Um, we will see. You know, only time will tell uh, in the war that is cryptography you know, between the good guys and the bad guys. We will see whether Sipash survives, but it seems to be the popular thing right now. But you should think about that. So, a few final thoughts. Hash function. The quality of the hash function, how well it makes an even distribution of the keys. This matters more than the speed of the hash function itself. Um, I have an example whereby making the hash function slightly slower, I improved my performance of a particular test case by approximately 100,000 times. I never actually let the test case complete before. Um, and Andres had a, a, a thing where he, he made a hash function that was more complicated and was six times slower, but that was uh, two or three orders of magnitude faster in overall performance. So, you know, so once again, right, one cache miss, a thousand instructions, 
So if you're just writing instructions that access in memory, right, you can do a lot of them in the hash function before it's actually costing you. Uh, hash function quality does not equal complexity. There are many good, simple hash functions. There are many terrible, complicated hash functions. Remember that the hash method is only half of the hash function. And don't believe the authorities. Don't believe me. Test it yourself. Profile it. Test it. <laughs> Question. 